All right. Good morning, guys. If you've got a Bible, and I hope you do, open with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 is where we're going to be at this morning. Uh, Before we do anything else, let me just go ahead and pray for us, because once we dive in, we're going to move pretty quick uh, through Matthew 21, 1 through 11. So I want to pray so I don't forget to do that later. And uh, let's uh, just go to the Lord and ask Him to bless our time, okay? Pray with me. God, I thank you so much for um, the opportunity this morning to preach your word. God, I pray that the words would ring true first and foremost in my life, God. Lord, this has um, been such a reality check for me this morning. God, I pray that you would reign in my life as King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, as we move into um, Holy Week this week, God, I pray that our hearts would be attuned to who you are and what you have for us, and what you want for us in the coming days, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. uh, So, first of all, happy Palm Sunday. I know uh, for many of us this is a a really special week as we begin to move toward Easter. I want to go ahead and uh, let you know that this week we're going to walk through Holy Week as a church together. If you have Facebook or Instagram, uh, be sure to follow us at uh, either Upstate Church, First Baptist, Simpsonville, our, um, Upstate Church, Five Forks, Harrison Bridge, well, all the accounts. Go follow them, okay? Uh, because we're going to post this week um, devotionals every day to walk through, walk us through Holy Week as Jesus journeys to the cross, starting today with Palm Sunday, okay? So Palm Sunday is the day that marks Jesus' triumphal entry um, into Jerusalem as he... Uh, makes clear for us on Palm Sunday uh, exactly who he is. Now, here's what I want to do to kind of get us in a frame of reference uh, for what's happening on Palm Sunday. I want to set the stage up uh, by giving us an illustration from history that kind of shows us what's going on here on Palm Sunday. So let me just ask this question to start off with. Is anybody in here like royal family followers, like you're in the whole thing with the royal family? Anybody? Man, okay, one person who's not ashamed of it. Raise your hand. (laughs) My wife didn't raise her hand. <laughs> okay, like my wife didn't raise her hand, all right? So this is where all this is coming from, all right? So let me, ju- let me put it to you like this way, all right? I, I have never been a really big royal fa- f- family follower until Jenna wanted to watch this series on Netflix called The Crown. Anybody seen this series on Netflix? Okay, okay. So if, if you've watched The Crown, you're a fan of the royal family, Okay. <laughs> So this, fan, this, this show on The Crown, just like, let's watch it. This Netflix called The Crown. I'm like, I don't know about this, right? And I, I was like, it looks historical, so like, yeah, maybe I'd like it. I, I, my, there's a huge part of me that's like um, just American through and through. I'm like, we fought a war in 1776 for me not to worry about The Crown, right? And, and so I, 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 I was like, we'll see what it's like. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I went like hook, line, and sinker into it, right? So much so that me and Jenna a couple weeks ago were watching the royal family interview with like Harry and Meghan, right? And I was like, y'all better not say one bad word about the queen, right? I'm like, y'all don't you talk about that lady. She's 100 years old. And I mean, I got invested, all right? But all of that to say, on June 2nd, 1953, was a historic day in Great Britain, in um, the United Kingdom, uh, for the royal family. On that day, crowds lined the roads in London, despite bad weather, despite the storms that were going to move in later in the day, shoulder to shoulder, to catch a glimpse of the new sovereign as she made her way into Westminster Abbey. Into that building walked a princess named Elizabeth Windsor, and three hours later walked out Queen Elizabeth II. And what followed was a coronation parade of epic proportions as people were packed shoulder to shoulder to try to get a glimpse of this symbol of hope, of this symbol of power, of this symbol of authority. And as she rode through the streets of London, she rode in a gold plated chariot pulled by 12 white stallions, okay? So get this image, and, and through as she rode through London, the chant that was going out to Queen Elizabeth was God save the queen, God save the queen, God save the queen. Now, I I want you to use your imagination a little bit and and picture this, okay? Picture this moment of hope for the people of Britain. That though the last monarch had died, the one that had saw them through World War II and seen them through some of the most, uh, most... perilous times imaginable that this new queen, a woman queen, right? Not very often that uh, a, a woman queen, that's an oxymoron. 
a woman's monarch, right? There was only, there's only been a handful in the history of, of the United Kingdom. And, and this symbolizes this, this moment of hope and, and of, of triumph of moving into the modern era, right? I want you to put yourself there. I want you to imagine the hope that's in that moment. And here's why. I think imagining that begins to give us a glimpse of what's actually happening the day of Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You see, so often I think what happens is we don't read Scripture with our imagination such that we read through it and we're just bored by it. And I can obviously see why, because we don't understand clearly what's happening. But today we're going to see a similar scene in Scripture. However, we aren't going to see the arrival of the Queen of England. We're going to see the arrival of the King of Kings. And in his coronation parade, listen to me, Jesus intends to fully reveal himself to us in such a way that after this moment, there can never again be questioned about who he is. Understand what I'm saying. Until this moment in Jesus' life, there has been speculation. There has been rumor. There have been questions uh, just aloft about who this person is. But on this day, Jesus makes clear once and for all, not only to his disciples, but publicly who exactly he thinks himself to be. Put simply, on Palm Sunday, Jesus makes clear that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, come to save sinners. So with that in mind, let's put ourselves in, uh, let's uh, use our imaginations enough to put ourselves in this coronation parade and start in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. Here's what scripture says. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of a burden. Pause. If you underline things in your Bible, I want you to underline Matthew 21, verse 5. Here's why. So often we don't know how to read the Bible. We don't see when the Bible's making to us an an emphatic declaration about something. I can tell you right now, by Matthew quoting 21, verse 5, we're going to see in just a second, the Bible is making to us an emphatic declaration about something. We need to be willing to take Take note of. We'll come back to it in just a second. Verse 6. Then the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They bought the donkey and the colt and put them on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying who is this and the crowd said this is the prophet jesus from nazareth of galilee so as we dive into this let my declaration let everything else you you hear from me today serve to show you what i what i was saying jesus is doing this whole time jesus is declaring to us who he is in this moment okay everything we're about to see is about to serve to prove that point Okay, here's the first thing I want you to see. Jesus is the king of kings. The first thing that becomes clear about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is that he is asserting himself as, as the king above all kings. Now, here's what I want us to do. I want us to notice first how Jesus asserts himself as king in this picture. Matthew 21, verse 5 is a quotation from Zechariah 9.9. Read it with me one more time. It's that important. I need to read it twice. The, the prophet Zechariah says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, and the foal, the beast of burden. Now, this is a quote 
that the prophet Zechariah gave to the people of Israel, even as they were returning from exile, that all of these people, their, the people of Israel's question was, when is the promised Messiah going to come to us and deliver and restore us from our troubles and from our sins and restore to us the kingdom of Israel? This was the question that the people of Israel had had ever since they went into Babylonian captivity. Really ever since the, uh, the kingdom split between the northern and southern kingdoms. The, the question that the people of Israel had is when is this king who was promised to David going to come to us? And the prophet Zechariah says that you will know this king has arrived on the scene when he comes entering into Jerusalem riding on a, uh, riding on a donkey. Now we'll see why just a second why this could only be one person, okay? Because normally kings don't come this way, okay? But I want you to notice what Jesus is asserting. Now, here's what I want you to know. Jesus grew up knowing the Old Testament. Like, you know how you kind of know the Old Testament? Jesus knew the Old Testament, okay? Jesus actually read Leviticus, okay? So Jesus knew all of the Old Testament. He knew that Zechariah 9-9 was in there, that this prophecy was that the king who would restore Israel would come in riding on a colt. So get this image together. He gets together his, his disciples one day. He says, boys, come up. Let's talk. Let's have a, a, a little uh, group think here. And I can almost hear Peter now. What do you want us to do, Jesus? And he says, Peter, do you remember that prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 9, where the king who's going to restore Israel, he's going to come in riding on a donkey? And Peter says, yes, I remember that, Jesus. And Jesus says, go get the donkey. What's he saying? I'm here, right? Jesus knew what he was saying when he was telling the disciples, go and get the donkey. In other words, the king who everyone has been looking for is now here. Jesus is saying, that's me. He knows what he's doing here. This is not some blind chance or moment of ignorance on Christ's part. He is, this is a deliberate assertion. As king, this is the equivalent, right, of somebody showing up in Buckingham Palace and sitting down on the throne saying, this is mine now, right? That, that's what Jesus is doing, saying, I'm here. But I, I, want you to, I want you to see he's asserting himself as king, but I, I want us to also see how he receives the welcome of a king. Okay, look with me at Matthew 21. Verse 8, this is what the scripture said. As he came in, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Okay? Now, a lot of times what happens is, is we don't study the Bible enough. Listen, this is not something a preacher should know, okay? This is something that you should fit the, start to pick out as you read through Scripture, okay? So we don't, but we don't study it enough to understand what's happening here. When the Bible says that the people were laying their cloaks on the, on the road, this is a direct sign of submission on the crowd's part as they recognize Jesus as king. As a matter of fact, we see this happening in the Old Testament whenever a new king is recognized in Israel, specifically 2 Kings 9.13. This is the case of King Jehu. As King Jehu came back into Jerusalem on a horse, the, the crowds took their clothes and they laid them on the ground saying that as a direct sign of demission, uh, submission, saying, you are the king. You, and now what, you might be asking, why is this a sign of submission? And putting their clothes on the ground, what they were saying is that as king, you are above us and we are below you. Now see what's happening here is Jesus comes in on this donkey. The crowds take their cloaks and they put them on the, uh, on the road. And what they're saying to Jesus is, Jesus, we are beneath you. Now notice what Jesus does here. He accepts their proclamation. Jesus is, in, in fact, when he comes in, is responding to the crowd, yes, yes, you are beneath me. Now, this is somewhat foreign to us, okay? Because a lot of times when we talk about Jesus, as a matter of fact, most of the way we think about Jesus, we tend to think about Jesus as like a colleague or a partner in crime or like a co-equal, right? Like, we, we even tend to talk about this in the way we talk about Jesus, uh, even in the church, right? How do we describe Jesus? Oh, Jesus, he's a friend of sinners, right? And, and so what happens is, as we begin to uh, put ourselves on an equal plane with Jesus, but Jesus is making clear as he comes into Jerusalem, this is not an equal playing field. He is the king, and we are beneath him, and he is above us. 
But I also want you to see they put branches on the road, okay? Now, this, was a symbo- this is symbolic for the people of Israel. They would only put palm branches on the road in, in instances of victory when they had driven an enemy out of Jerusalem or they had protected Jerusalem from an enemy. As the army or the king had, would, when, uh, would proceed back in, they would lay the palm branches on the road, and, and it was a clear sign of victory that as the people come back in, we come back in as conquerors right? And so now get the picture here. They have laid their clothes on the ground. They have said to Jesus, you are above, we are below. And then they begin to lay palm branches, sending a clear signal that this king who comes, he comes to us in victory. He is the conquering king, even as he comes on a humble donkey. Now why? Think about that. Most of the time when kings come, they come to send the message, right? They, they come in power. Right? They come with armies, they come, they come on stallions, and the unequivocal message of a king riding in the town is, hey, I could take you if I wanted to. Right? But not this king. He comes in as a king riding on a donkey, humble and submitted. So here's what we need to do. At this moment right here, before we even move on to anything else Jesus shows us, we need to deal with the implications of what it means that Jesus has come to us as king. I think the clearest way that I, can, that I can kind of reconcile is we need to begin to understand what it means that Jesus has come to us as king and begin to understand that Jesus has not come to us to be our cheerleader. Okay? So many of us, when, as we begin to think about what Jesus is to us, like our, and I don't know where it's come from. I don't know if it's come from like our, our modern day psychology of like you are enough. But as we begin to think about who Jesus is, like our mind just goes to a place where like Jesus has just come to like make up for what I lack, right? Like Jesus wants me to be the best version of myself. Philippians 4.13 kind of deal, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Tebow running out on the field with eye black, right? It's not what that means, bro. All right? So, yeah, somebody doesn't like Florida, okay? Amen. <laughs> My guy. Or, 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 even, or even worse, like we view Jesus as some kind of life coach, right? Like some of us come to church, right? And we understand, like, why do you need to go to church? Well, I just need Jesus to give me some, like, guidance in my life, right? I need him to direct me. Right? And, and what do we pray? Oh, I need some, I need him, Jesus, will you just lead God and direct me? So Jesus becomes some kind of deified life coach. Or, or, or maybe even worst of all, right, we look at Jesus and we just think, well, Jesus has come to be our friend. And now listen to me. I'm not saying there's any of those elements that are not some, in some way scripturally true. Has Jesus come to, to make us the best version of ourselves? Absolutely. Has Jesus come to be friend of sinners? The scripture says it. Has Jesus come to lead God and direct our life? God, I hope so because I need it. But what I'm telling you is that Palm Sunday shows us that Jesus has primarily come to be our king. And that we do not get the benefit of, the benefit of a relationship with Jesus, friend of sinners, life coach, cheerleader, until we have recognized him as our king. This is where modern Christianity needs a Palm Sunday checkup. Jesus does not disguise the fact that he, as he comes to save us, he has come as king. And before you can have a relationship with a king, here's what must happen. You must first bend the knee. Can I tell you, I love this phrase. It's an idiom that has been lost in American society because we're so anti-monarchial, right? Like, we're literally one of the only societies in the world that was like, we will go to war so we don't have to listen to a king, right? And that's awesome, right? I love America. But in that, we've lost some of these phrases like bend the knee. So let me explain to you what bend the knee means, okay? To, to bend the knee is an idiom that means you, you live, you understand that the posture before someone should be a posture of submission, right? Such that you don't have the benefits of a relationship until the posture of submission is assumed. Let me give you an example of that. If you were to go to Buckingham Palace right now, right? Walk into Buckingham Palace and by some miracle get an appointment with the queen and you just had some like grievance to air with the queen, right? You, were be, you, you had been done wrong uh, by the United Kingdom in some way and you walked into the, the, to the queen's office and you were about to talk to her. You do not get to, uh, to come before the queen in any form of relationship until you bend the knee. In other words, until you bow. 
The posture of submission must be assumed before the benefit of relationship can begin. And listen, if you come in there and don't bow the knee, one of those guys with that tall furry hat has been waiting on the day, right? (laughs) He's like, dear God, please let someday be the day that some American doesn't bow, right? Like, the, but the, the benefit of relationship doesn't begin until the posture of submission has been, has been undertaken. So understand this. This is a major point of application for us on Palm Sunday. Have you bent the knee to Christ the King? Have you recognized Christ as King of your life? Because understand me, there is no benefit of relationship until you have bent the knee. But sadly, so many of us want the benefits of relationship with Christ without bending the knee to Christ as king. I'm, go, I'm going to reference the crown one more time, okay? This is this, there was this great scene that really illustrates this moment, okay? Uh, and, and you got to go watch it. I'm telling you, it's great. But if you watch season one, you got to remember Queen Elizabeth was like 26 when she became Queen of England, right? She was my age, right? You would not have want, you do not want me to be king of England right now. I'm just telling you. I'd be like, what can we bomb today, right? But <laughs> too far, Dallas. All right. But there's this great scene in, in, in season one where you, she, she is a young woman. You got to remember, is this like has a young family, two young kids, right? And she's, and she's struggling to figure out what this means as her as sovereign. And by all accounts, uh, Prince Philip, who was not, he was the Duke of Edinburgh at the time. He wasn't a prince yet. There's some history for you. Uh, he was, by all accounts, like a prideful man, right? He, and, and understandably so, he was, he was born royalty himself. Now, I don't know if this part was dra- uh, dra- dramatized for television purposes, but there's this great scene where as she's about to uh, be co- uh, receive the crown, right, in her coronation, the prince comes to, uh, Prince Philip comes comes to uh, Queen Elizabeth, and he says, I don't want to bow at the coronation. And he asks her this question. He says, are you my queen or are you my wife? And she says, I am both. And her, his response is, I will not bow before my wife. And man, her, her comeback is it, it, just a mic drop moment. This is what she says. She says, your wife is not asking you to. Your queen is commanding it. And here's, here, here's, the, here's, the, here's what's understood in this moment. That you don't get the benefits of the relationship of wife, right? Until you bend the knee to the queen. Now, and I, that's completely like illustrative. But here's the thing. I think so many times we do this with Jesus. That we come to Jesus and we want the forgiveness of sins, right? Well, gee, that sounds pretty good. Heaven instead of hell, I'll take it right? Lead, guide, and direct me. I'll take it. Be the best version of myself. Have the best marriage possible. Jesus, yes, I want all of those things. But we want all of those things without first assuming the posture of submission. And here's what I want us to understand. You don't get one without the other. Have you bent the knee to Jesus? So Jesus is the king of kings is first. Second thing I want you to see is that Jesus is the Savior. Notice what the crowds are chanting to Jesus as he, as he comes into the city. They're crowding, Hosanna, uh, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, what's really strange about this is that this is not an, a, a prominent Hebrew word, okay? As a matter of fact, uh, it's not even a title. I think so many times when we read this, we assume that Hosanna is a title that is being issued to Jesus. As a matter of fact, it's it's more of an imploration than it is a title. As a matter of fact, the only time I can find that there are only two cases in which this is used in the Old Testament period, two situations in which this is used. The first situation is that this is a, um, when a person is in a desperate situation, they would come before the king and implore the king Hosanna, which literally means, oh, save us. Right? It's not, it's not a title as, as much as it is an imploration, oh, save me. So one, this, if you go in, uh, this is somewhere in 2 Kings, I forgot the reference, but there's a widow who comes before the king and they cry out, oh, dear king, Hosanna. In other words, oh, dear king, save me. Right? So this is an imploration. The other situation is when any time in Scripture, when the people of God have reached a, such a desperate situation that they can't pull themselves out of it. Think the book of Judges, right? You know, the, God would rise up oppressors to oppress the people of Israel uh, because of, they were, of their rebellion. The people of Israel would then cry out, what? Hosanna, which meant God, save us. 
So don't miss the connection here. The people of Israel now, the people of God, are recognizing Christ as the one who has the power to save as he rides into Jerusalem as a king to claim his throne. Part of what Jesus is showing us here on Palm Sunday is that the hero has come to save the day. And I know that sounds like somewhat cheesy, but literally I can't think of a better way to describe it. This is why we love hero stories in our, in our society, right? This is why we love these hero so much, stories so much because they point us back to the reality of the genuine hero who came to save us. Has anybody ever seen Avengers Endgame, right? If not, it's a moment of, So listen, my wife had never seen the end of it, okay? We found this out last night as we were talking about it. Spoiler alert part two. Yeah, amen. <laughs> it's a good one, all right? That me, me, me and Jenna were talking last night, and come to find out, Jenna had never seen the end of Avengers Endgame. So I had two options in that moment. Divorce or force her to watch it, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. She's going to be like, you a divorce, huh? No. <laughs> So I, I was like, you have to watch it because you've got to see the end. But if you've seen the end of this movie, right, there's this one moment, and I, I literally fell asleep because I'd already seen it, and I woke up last night right as Iron Man snapped his fingers, right? He says, and I am Iron Man. He snaps his finger and just saves the day, right? And that moment, like, I, almost, I woke up and almost instantly went to crying, right? Because it's awesome. And as, as corny as that sounds, guys, as, as cheesy as that sounds, this is the type of declaration that Jesus is making on Palm Sunday. That you have been looking for a hero and you have no need to look any further because he is riding in before you. Now, here's what becomes clear. As a Savior, he had already established how he was going to save. Everybody remember this? He, he looks to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, and the Bible says he began, he, be, he began to tell them of how the Son of Man must travel to Jerusalem and suffer many things and die. This, this is in Matthew chapter 16. This is when Peter comes to him and says, Lord, may it never be, right? And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, right? Just a quick thing, if Jesus calls you Satan, you're not doing real well, all right? You're, you're, all, you're out of it. But he tells them, he basically tells the disciples, here's how I'm going to save people. I'm going to the cross. But what becomes clear is that the people of Israel who are now crying, Hosanna, wanted a Savior, but they didn't want Jesus' way of salvation. You see, the people assumed that Christ was coming to deliver them from the Romans, right? At this time, the people of Israel were under Roman persecution because they were, they were monotheists. They believed that they could only bow down and worship God as God. And in, in Rome at that time, the, the people believed that Caesar was a God too, so you had to bow down to him. And so the people of Israel said, listen, we'll pay our taxes to Caesar, but we will only bow down to God. So they were under intense persecution, right? And at this time, as they were under intense persecution, they believed that if the Messiah showed up, that the, the Messiah was going to deliver them from political, uh, from political damnation, not spiritual damnation. The people were crying, oh, save us, but Christ had bigger plans for salvation than they could have possibly imagined. You see, the people didn't realize that our Savior is different than any other Savior because He saves by sacrifice. Our Savior wins by losing. Our Savior gives life by dying. Now, you might be asking, why is this important? We obviously know that He meant to come and save by the way of the cross, even if the people of Israel didn't. Why is this important? See, I want us to not miss the point that the people of Israel thought that a temporal king was of more benefit than an eternal savior. And now so often as we read back on this, what happens is, is we think, how foolish were they? But if I can be as blunt as, I, as possible here and just as clear as possible, we do the exact same thing. We miss that Jesus Christ has not come, at least not in this coming, to give us political victories, has not come to give us earthly victories, has not come to give us temporal victories, but that He has come to bring eternal salvation. But so often, what we want to do is take the benefits of Jesus Christ and apply them to the earthly situation that we're in and believe that a temporary king would be better to us than an eternal savior. 
And now we, none of us can say we don't do this. Because listen to me, I just lived through 2016 and 2020, and here's what I know. We all do this. We all believe that at some level that what we need most importantly right now is, a, is an earthly king, an earthly president, to de, uh, to a temporary president to deliver us out of our problems. And what Jesus is here to show us is that the hope of mankind is not in Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Jesus here is, to, is here to show us that the hope of mankind is not in earthly kings or presidents, but in the eternal king who has come to save. And here's the good news. We'll get all the other stuff thrown in later, but just not yet. We'll talk about it in a second. I'm getting ahead. Last thing I want you to see, uh, the band's like he's getting ahead and he's out of time. Jesus, there's the last thing I want you to see. Jesus is Lord of Lords. Jesus is Lord of Lords. The final thing that makes that uh, the triumphal entry makes clear is that Jesus is Lord of Lords, Lord of all. As Jesus begins to enter, the religious authorities are disturbed at the way in which the authority is being attributed to Christ. Right? They're, they're liter- the, the Bible literally says the city is stirred up. Right? People, the people are troubled, and the, and the religious authorities, what they're seeing is that if, this, if these people think Jesus is the king, we're done. Right? We're finished. And so here's what they do. Luke 19, verse 39 and 40. I want us to read it together real quick. This is really important for us to see. Jesus is going to go one step further in declaring to us exactly who he is. Luke 19, 39 and 40. Here's what the scripture says. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, what they said is, Jesus, they are saying they are beneath you, that, they, that you are above them, that you are the king. You can't, Jesus, you have to rebuke them, correct them. What is Jesus' response? No, they're right, right? But look at verse 40. This is where it gets really good. Verse 40. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I can almost get this image of the Pharisees saying, hey, rebuke them, Jesus. And Jesus saying, shh. Do you hear that? And the Pharisees are like, this dude's psycho, right? He's losing it. He, and they're like, no, what, hear what? He's saying that if these people refused to worship those rocks beneath your feet, they would begin to shout my praises. And now Jesus is making two things really clear here, okay? The first thing he's making clear is that he is no earthly king. Because here's what I can promise you, okay? Even as Queen Elizabeth rode through the streets of London, there was not a cobblestone on the street that was like, hey, maybe we should praise this woman, right? Just didn't happen. So what's Jesus saying? That I'm not like the other kings and queens. That I'm going to get the the praise and worship I'm worthy of, whether these people open their mouths or not. Moreover, he's making a direct assault against the hardness of heart of the Pharisees. What's he saying? These rocks underneath my feet, their heart is not as hard as yours is. Because guess what? These rocks would cry out even if you kept your mouth shut. Here's what Jesus is coming to say. I'm the king, and you can bend the knee or you can bend the knee. So here's what I want us to do. I want to close with really two invitations. First is this, this Palm Sunday, we've got to begin to recognize who we're dealing with here. I use this language of king of kings, because, and, and I, I, I want us to tie it to the reality of who Jesus is, because I think, sadly, church language has robbed us so much of this reality. When we picture Jesus as king of kings, we picture this white guy with blonde hair and blue eyes carrying, a, uh, carrying like the sheep around his neck, right? And that's not the image we're getting here. There's a lot more that's this equatable to what happened in London on June 2nd, 1953, than that picture in, that you grew up looking at at church. He's the king of kings. And so we need to recognize that this king comes offering peace this time. The terms of peace were simple. His life for your life. He goes to the cross. He takes your sin. You get his righteousness. The terms of peace are simple. You just must bend the knee. And you receive. That relationship begins. But understand this, church. He comes in peace this time. The second time, he will not come in peace. He will come to make war. 
Look at it with me real quick. I, I think we need to be reminded of this. Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16. Listen to me. We get so caught up in our modern day uh, views of the world that we forget that this is a coming reality. The same way that he came into Jerusalem, he's going to come back. Notice how he's going to come back. Listen to me. Verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness, what does he do? He judges and makes war. He's not just coming in on a, on a, on a donkey anymore. He's coming to set things right. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Let's stop right there for a moment. How boss of a move is it to have a name that nobody knows? right? Like, what's your name? Nobody knows but me, right? <laughs> you got Prince, that's pretty cool, one name. Madonna, that's pretty cool, one name. Jesus, no name, right? That's another level. He's got a name that nobody knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Let, let me just stop for a second. If I walk out this, ro this room today and I'm going and I'm feeling like a little aggressive, right? Maybe I'm feeling froggy, you want to throw some hands. And the first person I meet in the street has got clothes that are dipped in bloods, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to walk, right? We ain't picking that fight. The Bible says that if Jesus comes back, he's not just sitting on a donkey. He's got clothes that are dipped in blood. The image here is clear. You, you, you should probably get right before you meet this dude. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. Verse 14, And the armies of heaven were arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on horses. Get this. He's got blood on his clothes. The armies behind him are arrayed in white linen, fine and pure. In other words, they don't have any blood on their clothes. Why? He didn't need their help. They were just watching. Right? Jesus, you want us to jump in? No, I'm good. Thanks. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he strikes down the nations and he will rule them with a, rod, with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written what? King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to me guys. We can bend the knee now or we can bend the knee later. But we will bend the knee. So here's what I... My, my, my prayer here this morning is that if you've been living for the benefits of a relationship without submitting your life to God, do not leave this room without bending the knee and saying, God, my entire life is yours. And then finally, for those of us who are believers on this Palm Sunday, I can't get away from the fact that the Bible says when Jesus showed up, the city was stirred up. And I just can't help but get away from the fact that if Jesus does show up in our lives, the city should be stirred up because of us. And I'm praying that this Palm Sunday would be the beginning of that in our lives. Listen to, you. Listen to me, I'm, I'm preaching to you a word that needs to be preached to myself, that he is king of kings and I must bend the knee. So I'm assuming if it's true for me, it's true for you. So this, this time as, we as you guys stand up and we worship, I'm just going to implore you to do business with God so that we leave here Palm Sunday understanding who he is. Stand up and pray with me. God, thank you for who you are. I thank you for your word, Lord. God, I thank you that your word is clear about what exactly you came to be. Dear God, who exactly you are. But Lord, there is no middle ground with you. There is no relationship without submission. There is no friendship without kingship, God. And I pray that we would live in understanding that that should be the posture of our life, God. Just Holy Spirit, do work in us to put us in that position. In Jesus' name, amen.